Good afternoon. Welcome to Book Passages Author Conversation today. I'm Allison Bainbridge, and I am so excited to introduce our authors today for what I anticipate to be a thrilling conversation, as well as very entertaining. Um, I have to admit that I am a bit of a fangirl of our featured author today, Karen Slaughter. I've hosted hundreds of authors, and Karen is the only author for whom I have actually subscribed to her email newsletter so that I know when her next book is coming out. And I read a a lot of best-selling fiction. Um, I have to say mystery is the genre that I read when I need escapism, which these days is a lot. Um, Karen's books are perfect to distract me from the real life drama in our world. So I want to thank Karen for that. And I wish you could write faster. Um, I became a huge fan of Karen's when she was in her bookstore about five years ago to talk about might have been The Last Widow. Um, I was standing at the back uh, listening to her and I was literally laughing out loud, um, kind of embarrassed, like laughing so loud that I thought it, you know, maybe I needed to um, go far away and not be heard. Um, in fact, um, she was so funny that I looked up her bio to see if she'd done stand up before. Um, her humor hooked me on her on her mystery books, ironically. Um, then I had the fortune to help with the Book Passage Mystery Writing Conference that year, and I realized that mystery writers have the best senses of humor. It makes sense, no pun intended, um, because they are often writing about such dark subjects. So today we're going to be hearing about Karen's latest book, Girl Forgotten. A small town hides a big secret. Who killed Emily Vaughn? A girl with a secret an unsolved murder, one final chance to uncover a killer. And um, I'm gonna let Karen and uh, Cara Black talk about um, the book itself. Um, I just wanna give you a little bit more information about Karen. She lives in Atlanta. Um, she's the author of more than 20 instant New York Times bestselling novels, including the Edgar nominated Cop Town and standalone novels, Pretty Girls, The Good Daughter and Pieces of Her. She is published in 120 countries with more than 40 million copies across the globe. Um, if you haven't seen it, Pieces of Her is a Netflix original series starting, starring Tony Collette. It's wonderful. Um, and Fal False Witness, the Grant County and Will Trent series are in development for television. Uh, Karen's the founder of a wonderful nonprofit, Save the Libraries Project. It's an organization established to support libraries and library programming. And uh, I hope, Karen, you'll give it a mention. Um, we're also so lucky to have Kara Black with us today as Karen's In Conversation partner. Um, Kara is a huge supporter and friend of Book Passage. In fact, she is actually one of the um, chairs of our fabulous mystery writing conference. She's the author of Murder at the Porte de Versailles and 20 books in um, the New York Times bestselling Amy LeDuc series, as well as the series Three Hours in Paris. She has received multiple nominations for the Anthony McCavity Awards, and her books have been translated into multiple languages. She lives in San Francisco with her husband and son, and in Paris, she frequents Paris um, often. Um, once again, I'm so thrilled to present Karen Slaughter and Kara Black. Thank you, Allison. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. I'm just so thrilled to talk with Karen Slaughter because I just finished this book, which is going to be out tomorrow in the US, um, Girl Interrupted. And I was up late last night, you know, because you're doing your job again, Karen. You're just putting that the thrills and so much. But I really want to, you know, have you tell us all about this book. But I just want to say some of the reviews came in and and someone who's very respected in our genre. Michael Conley said that your characters, plot and pacing are unrivaled among thriller writers working today, which is just, you know, something that people need to know that thriller writers are, the characters are not cardboard. And um, the Washington Post says, it slaughters prodigious gifts of characterization that make her stand out among thriller writers. And that's, that's why Karen is just so huge. Um, so Karen, welcome. It's wonderful to be here with you virtually. 
I know you'll be starting a big book tour. I love this book. Um, can you can you tell us about the book, Karen? Because it'll be new to everyone who's listening. Well, I, I think of it as a cold case book because I really love cold cases. And it starts with a young woman in 1982 named Emily Vaughn, who's going to her senior prom. And as the 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 chapter plays out, we learn there's a lot more going on to Emily than we thought in first light. And of course, since she's in the first chapter of a Karen Slaughter novel, you know, things don't go very well for her. I won't give away any spoilers there. Uh, but then we fast forward 40 years and we catch up with a character named Andrea Oliver. And people might recognize her from pieces of her. Uh, I don't think of this as a sequel so much as in the world of pieces of her because it's it's a very different sort of book. Andrea in pieces of her, she's the typical millennial kind of spinning around. And Laura, her mother, is saying to her, look, you got to get a career. You got to get out of my garage apartment. You got to start <laughs> adulting. And, you know, in typical uh, mother fashion, Andy has done that. And Laura's like, I didn't want you to do it this way in that apartment, in that job. And it has a real problem with Andrea being a U.S. Marshal. And so Andrea's first assignment kind of has her crossing paths with Emily in a weird way because she goes to this small town in Maryland where Emily grew up. And she's got a, an ulterior motive for looking into what happened to Emily Vaughn. So how was that bringing, you know, Andy back? Okay, she's older now, two years older. How, how was writing that? You know, it was a lot of fun. I tend to write about really strong women. And with Andrea, it's more of, she starts out at kind of a, she describes herself as a, an amoeba responding to stimuli, which I think a lot of us can relate to when we're in our <laughs> the prime of our youth. Uh, but she had to do a lot of growing up. And by the end of pieces of her, she, she's a different person. And I wanted to write about that different person, you know, because she does have an odd situation where both her, her, her parents are stone cold criminals and only one of them feels bad about that. And so I think her question in pieces of her is, who is my mother and who am I in relation to that? And with Girl Forgotten, she's saying, you know, am I a bad person? Am I a good person? Did my father start out being a bad person? And she kind of learns I can choose to be a better person than my parents, which also is an important message. Right. I mean, she really does grow in this story. And so is that kind of when you were writing, um, writing that, did, did Andrea, did you see a future for her? Or did she kind of come from that? Or um, where, where did this story come from? A couple of different places. You know, when I finished writing pieces of her, so that was, I, I can't do the math, more than this many years ago. Um, it, I kind of thought it was a standalone and mm -hmm. I didn't really think about the characters. I moved on. I wrote another Will Trent book. I, I wrote another book called False Witness. And then I, I started reading some of the scripts that they sent me from the Netflix series about, you know, Andrea and Laura. And, and it just made me start thinking about Andrea again and, and what happened to her next. I mean, you know this, Cara, every book starts with a question that you have to answer at the end. And sometimes it's a who done it question. And sometimes it's a why done it. And sometimes it's, well, what happens to this person who sees this bad thing? And that was what I was thinking about with Andrea. It was just, you know, how, how would she respond to this? You know, she's fairly traumatized by what happened to her. And in a lot of ways, we generally tend to repeat the mistakes that our parents make, whether we want to or not. And so she's done what Laura did around that same age. She just blew up her life. You know, Laura made some criminal choices, Andrew's choices to become a marshal. And, you know, part of that, I think, is her thinking, OK, well, if I'm a marshal, then that means I'm a good person. Uh, but we all know that putting on the badge, unfortunately, isn't automatic. You know, we have some some people out there wearing a badge who aren't necessarily good guys. And she comes to realize that the choices she makes decides how she's going to be a marshal. And she's got a great mentor 
who is helping her along the way, kind of directing her sales in the right direction. And he's so against stereotype, well, against what I think. I'm sorry, but when I think of Rangers, I think of Tommy Lee Jones, right, going after <laughs> Harrison Ford as a fugitive. And there's so much in here I had no idea about the Rangers and, you know, how and the whole witness, the WITSEC um, program, you know, how did you find out all that information? Well, you know, I know a lot of law enforcement people, but I, I, I asked my friend Lisa Gardner, who has done a lot of stuff with the FBI and she's got some good FBI contacts, if they had any martial contacts. And so she tracked one down for me. It was it was kind of like a potato chips, you know. You couldn't just get one, you know. The, it's a very small community, so they're like, "We'll call Bob and call Jack or call Brooke or call." And so I ended up getting a tour of the headquarters for the South wow. um, Marshals, and they do amazing things. You know, they're kind of the Swiss Army knife of federal law enforcement. Um, they do fugitive ap apprehension. That's the Harrison Ford movie. We know that justified. Raylan was a U.S. Marshal, and he's really kind of close to what a U.S. Marshal is like because they're kind of dick swingers. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I would say probably Nicolas Cage in, in Con Air uh, is the, even though he's not a Marshal in that, that film, is like the furthest thing from what a Marshal would be like. <laughs> um, and, you know, I just got to talk to him. I was really fascinated the, the hell they go through to be a Marshal. And I don't know about you, whenever I talk to women in law enforcement, my first question is always, why the hell would you do this? And not because it's not a great job and, you know, there are people well suited for it. But, you know, when a guy wants to be a cop, his family's like, oh, that's fantastic. And when a woman does, they're like, oh, are you a lesbian? Are you, are you never going to date? Are you going to, you know, you won't have children. You'll get shot. You'll, I mean, all this stuff that society puts on them. And not to mention, you know, once they get in, there's horrific hazing that women have to put up for, put up with and sexism and, you know, not all departments, but a, it, it, there's a lot of pushback. There's not a lot of support. Um, and what I found out was really interesting. You know, I mean, like a lot of people you find in these positions that they want to serve, they're really called to it. Um, but the marshals, they don't haze new marshals. Because what they do is really dangerous, you know. It's not. It's not like they're doing a, writing traffic tickets and they're pulling over somebody in a minivan who's got six kids in the back. And you know, when they go to a house, they know who the bad guy is. He's already been convicted. They know all of his crimes. They know what they're dealing with, um, and they take it very seriously, which is a good thing. Right. Um, but they also do all kinds of weird things, like. They secured the vaccines during transportation to keep nut jobs from going after them. They investigate murders in Antarctica. There are marshals all around the world, and there's very few of them, but they're the oldest law enforcement uh, at the federal level in America. George Washington himself started the marshal service. Um, so it's a very storied and elite kind of uh, law enforcement. And most of the time when we see on television, an FBI agent doing something. It's really a marshal who would do that. Um, so I don't know why they don't get better press, maybe because they're, they just, uh, they don't have the PR. It's fascinating. That's just totally fascinating. I had no idea. I mean, I'm, I'm like everyone else, you know, we think of the, it's the mob, the mafia or in witness protection. And, and, you know, I, and I think it's very different. I mean, Laura, the character, Ali's mother, um, Andrea's mother is, is very, different um you know and everyone has an agenda which i love in your stories you know everyone has their own angle and it's things that i would never think about you know you think oh they must be so happy to be protected you know in in witsec but that's not always the case right no well you have to remember the majority of people in witness security are there for a bad reason you know they were associating with criminals and they saw something criminal happen right or they're criming themselves and they get caught and like the way they get out of it is say, uh, hey, I'll, I'll tell on my, my boss and so I don't get prison sentencing. But however, a lot of people in witness security do end up in prison. You know, they get their new identity, but they still have to serve their time. 
Uh, but once they get out, the thing, the marshals have this saying that, you know, no one who follows the rules ever, ever has been located and harmed. And like following the rules <laughs> is really hard for criminals, right? I mean, it's super hard. We all dream about like maybe never talking to anybody we know ever again and just living on a beach. But, you know, if, you, if you're used to being a criminal and suddenly you've got to clock in every day at Home Depot and not steal things, that's really hard, right? And if you're used to having like zillions of dollars and beautiful suits and all this kind of thing, and suddenly, you know, you're in Dockers, um, th that's a big adjustment. And a lot of them screw things up. Uh, but the marshals would say that's not our fault. And, it, and to be fair, it's not because, you know, most criminals get caught for a reason. <laughs> that's so true. It's just amazing. So we know um, we know that the next you know the next series is in production with TV. You, you said we could talk about it. Are you working on the script for that? And how is and how is that? If I can ask. So the Will Trent series has been picked up by ABC, and they're going to start uh, filming this fall. And the the showrunners um, are uh, a fantastic. Uh, group of people. Um, you know, one of them, Liz Heldens, I met with many years ago in Atlanta. She's She was filming something else and my Will Trent series wasn't available, but she just wanted to see me and talk to me uh, because she loves the books. And that's what you want when you're a writer is for someone to option it who really loves the books, understands the story, you know, gets what you're doing with per particularly with the Will Trent books. I mean, they're kind of a hybrid. Yeah, they're they're mysteries, they're procedurals, but they're also love stories. You know, right. and they're, they're family stories, and uh, you know, all these different sorts of things. A medical story, a legal story, rolled up into one. And she really gets that. And I've read the the pilot. I saw the pilot, and it's right. fantastic. I mean, it's ABC, so they can't have my fucks. Um, so it's like Will Trent, less the fucks, but that, you know, <laughs> that's okay. Um, but the stories are great. They really are. They, and they, the, the thing I, I know this bothers you when you watch a, a thriller on television is sometimes the plot just does not make sense. And you get the feeling they're more interested in how something looks or, you know, this particular scene or this emotional thing. And, you know, they kind of forget that crime readers want plot. That's why they're watching these shows and they feel really annoyed if the plot doesn't hold up. I mean, I think that's why Mayor of Easttown did so well. It's like, oh, the plot actually made a lot of sense, you know? <laughs> um, so they get that. Liz, Liz and Dan get that. And I'm, I'm super happy with it. I can't wait for, for it to start showing. Are you involved in any part of the script or anything like that? Or do you get any, a little any bit. say on the actors? Yeah. A little bit. I mean, I'm an executive producer, but I'm one of many. Ooh. So that means like if um if I have a suggestion and nobody else agrees with me, then <laughs> sorry. It's sort of like <laughs> in your contract with your books, you have consultation on your jacket. But you know, I, I don't know about you, but I've never said I hate this and they're like, okay, we'll change it. <laughs> You're right. Yeah. Ditto. Yeah. No. Consultation. Yeah. I don't think that word means what you think it means. Um, yeah. And actually, I will say when I when I have said that, I've been wrong, um, and they were absolutely right about it. But um, it, it's 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 a fascinating process. Um, I love watching it. it. It's it's a different part of your brain to do that sort of thing. Sure. And everybody sure. thinks. Like I, I think r romance writing is amazing, but I don't have the ability to write a straight romance, right? And I certainly couldn't write a children's book, one because I hate children. But yeah, you know, but apart there, from that, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So you know, well, I don't know. A lot of children's book writers hate children, um, <laughs> but I think that there's such a talent to it, right? And if you're a book writer, you maybe you couldn't be a script writer or, you know, whatever. Right. So I have a real appreciation for what they've done. Is there any time you've looked at it and you said, oh, they, you know, this character is, is cut or this character is amplified. And I sort of get it because of the way they do it, because it's always different, right? From the book. It is. Like everything is expressed through dialogue, right? 
and we get pages and pages of internal monologue. Like we can go for like a whole chapter and nobody speaks and, and no one complains about that. Right. right. But you can't do everything has to be expressed in dialogue. And it, so we were talking about this earlier, you and I, it's really different because chapters are not omniscient. When I write from Will, a Will chapter, everything that happens is from his perspective. And then when right. Sarah happens, you know, Will's perspective doesn't blend in. And that's kind of fun because a lot of times Will will think Sarah is thinking one thing and she's actually thinking another, which anyone who's ever been married knows that happens all the time. But, mm -hmm. you know, you yeah. can switch back and forth in a script and you know, that to me is crazy. It feels like you're breaking all kinds of rules. Um, but particularly with the plot um, in the pilot for Will Trent, they've, they've brought together two books in a really cool wow. way. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So I really, I, I'm very impressed by that. And I, I hope that people like it the way I do. Oh, sounds incredible. Well, speaking about, you know, Sarah Linton, one of my favorite characters, you know, I mean, it's about, you know, the place of Grant County, you know, that's really kind of a character in your stories, you know, it can only happen there, you know, and, and those stories. Can you talk about that? Because your sense, and especially sense of place in Girl Forgotten, you know, it's, it's very much there. It can only happen in this small town. And uh, you bring that so alive, Karen, really. Well, you know, you've done this probably where you've been to a town on a tour and you've been exhausted and you found something in that town. Like so I go for walks sometimes and I'll like find a little coffee shop or, or, you know, a library or something that really makes me remember it. And, you know, we're old enough to be, to remember when they sent you to 30 different cities in 30 days. Right. And how exhausting that was. And many, mm. many years ago, I was in the middle of one of those exhausting tours and I landed in Rehoboth Beach, Maryland. And it's a beautiful little coastal town. It is it is small. It's not so small now, um, especially because the Biden's uh, vacation there. So, you know, <laughs> I'm sure it's like very big now. But um, I was walking down the boardwalk and I found this cupcake shop and they had this cupcake that was the size of a baby's head. And, you know, with cupcakes, which I know quite a lot about, Usually the frosting's really good and the cake's dry or the cake's really good and the frosting's eh. This was a perfect <laughs> cupcake. Okay. So Kara, this was like 16 years ago and I remember that cupcake. Uh, and Memorable. So when, I, when I started to think about where this could be set, I thought, well, I'll make a town like Rehoboth Beach. Um, and, you know, it was really interesting to write about that part of the country and Maryland. And, you know, in the South, we don't, we think of states as kind of big, right? Like it would take me five hours to get to Alabama. Um, if, if I went to the, the far part of Alabama, we, we both know there's a Books A Million warehouse in Florence and that is like a long drive from Atlanta. <laughs> um, but, you know, if you're in, in Maryland, you've got DC and you've got, uh, New Jersey and you've got Philly and you got, you know, everything is kind of clustered. So it was a different way of thinking. And, and that was really a good frame of mind to put myself into for writing this book, because even though it's a Northern city, it's still a small town, right? Mm -hmm. And we all know small towns are very much microcosms of cities. So even when you, you go to New York, no one says, really, I live in New York City. They're like, I live on the Upper West Side, or I live in exactly. Chelsea, or the Village. Everybody attaches their neighborhood to their personality. And it's kind of shorthand. Like, if, if you tell me in Atlanta that you live in Buckhead, I'm going to think you're probably an asshole, right? But, it, like, there's all that kind of these assumptions about these different areas. And small towns are very much like that. And that's where I got Longville Beach. Um, you know, this is the small town where Andrea goes. It's where Emily grew up. And if anybody wants to know the real thing it's based on, it's Rehoboth Beach, where they have Rehoboth the beach. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I can, you know, and also, I mean, she also notes that, I mean, she's thinking and she's thinking it's kind of the kind of place where these people, they never leave. 
you know, which I think is so emblematic. So let's talk about the timeline. You've got the dual timelines, you know, in the past. Was that something that came to you? Were you always planning on doing it or thinking that was the way to tell this, this story? How did well, that I loved go? It. I love dual timelines. I've been doing uh, more and more of them. So I hope my readers mm-hmm. like them because I'm going to keep doing them. Um, <laughs> I just love that. I love the like sins of the past, uh, you know, being visited on the present. And it, you know, it gave me a chance to write about the 1980s, um, which is a Gen Xer. I feel like we got screwed over. We went from like boomer nostalgia straight to millennial nostalgia. It's like, wh- what about us? Right. <laughs> um, and so it was really neat to, I mean, I, in 1982, I wasn't Emily's age. She's uh, a lot older than me, but you know, I remember the perms and the blue eyeshadow and, you know, all the, the things that were going on. It was, and there's a mixtape in the book that I got to, mm-hmm. to put some songs on. And I was like, oh man, I can't believe I forgot about Juice Newton. She was amazing. <laughs> Um, and the Go-Go's, these earlier Go-Go songs. So, I mean, it was pretty cool to do that. So maybe my, my Gen X peeps out there, uh, represent, will appreciate that part of the book. Yeah, I'm sure. (laughs) That's so funny. Yeah. Do you make, so you make a playlist, do you, and do you listen to that when you're writing? I mean, does that help you, you know, get there in that moment? No, you know, I like, I have to have complete silence when I read. Um, I'm not one of these go to a, you know, a coffee shop and like have noise around me. I don't eat, I go to a cabin in the mountains that I've been going to for 20 years. My dad built it for me. I don't take my cats, you know, even like when I get in my car to drive there, it's a couple hours. I don't listen to music. I just think about the story and try to center myself on the characters and, you know, think about what I'm going to be doing in that part of the writing that I do. And, and that's really sacrosanct, you know, it really clears my head. Um, But, you know, I do think uh, music can be a fun thing, but you have to remember like one, one man's Beatles is another man's wham. Uh, So if you think the song (laughs) is really cool, you know, you might, the other people might not. So to the writers out there, don't use songs as shorthand for personality because it never works out. Exactly. So, so you're talking about process here and what you do. So, would you say you're a a, a plotter, a pantser, or a plunger? You know, you just jump right in there. Kind of sounds like you're wow. a plunger. I don't yeah, know. like a toilet plunger. I've never heard. Of, <laughs> I've never heard plunger. I've heard plotter and pantser a lot. Uh, uh, plunge. <laughs> Yeah. You know, I'm definitely not a plunger. No. Uh, I'm a little bit plotter, a little bit pantser. You know, I I think it's really important. Two things are really important to me. One is to know what you're doing, right? Mm -hmm. I don't just write into it. And part of that is, I mean, you know, this, we're on a schedule. We we can't be precious about it. This is a job. We, I mean, it's an artistic job, but we've got people waiting on these books, right? to do you signed a contract yeah Yeah. Yeah. well but also you know it it just screws so many people over if you don't Mm. do it right translators waiting and you know everybody's waiting for this and if you're late it screws them up and and i i guess i'm like a real team player so i don't do that (laughs) i try not to do that so in that regard i'm definitely a plotter and i think about the structure of the book and i i get a loose idea but then, yeah. then when I get into it, I, I, you know, I figure out a little bit of the things as I'm into it. Cause that's, that's the fun, right? It's like, I, I talked to Sarah Waters a long time ago and she's like, everybody thinks writing is so fun, but it's like 10 minutes of exhilaration where you're like, oh, they're going to do this and that, and this and that. And then the rest of the, the thousands of hours is just slogging through and connecting to those little inspiration points and making them work, you know, because everybody has at least one fantastic idea for a book. I really think that at least one, but that's not the hard part. The hard part is figuring out how to make it work. And that's what I think about when I'm writing the story is how does this going to work? How does this move the plot forward? What does this say about characters? You know, in, in every novel, you've got like a roller coaster. The tracks are the plot and the car is the emotion. And they have to all undulate at the same speed. Otherwise, it falls apart. 
So, you know, those, those are the things I'm thinking about, but also I think it's for me, very important to know who the, the culprit is, right? The bad guy or the bad girl before I start the novel. That way I, I feel like I can play fair with the reader and sprinkle in clues so that when they get to the end, instead of going, what the fuck, you know, it's like, oh, I can't believe I missed that. It makes total sense. Yeah, which I had to do, go back and go, of course, you, you set it all up, of course, you know, but that's also what you want your reader to just be there on the ride, not worrying about that, you know, so I really have to say you really pulled that off well and, and but, and along those lines, was there anything that su even surprised even you in this kind of journey of discovering the story and where it was going? Was there anything that you hadn't thought about that just surprised you, came out of nowhere? Well, you know, so it came out of my head. So it's a really weird thing to, I think, to say, well, that surprised me. I, I, so I would probably say more delighted me, right? Okay. Like if there's a, like a joke I can make that's a really long running joke. Um, like one of my delights is the hotel Andrea stays in is called Beach Please. <laughs> Which still tickles me. I love little things like that, you know? And I love, I mean, there's a character named Melody. Um, and, you know, so you go back and forth between Emily and Andrea. And Emily, like most people in in high school, they, they think no one understands them, that that everybody else feels understood. Everybody else feels comfortable, feels, you know, like a, they're going to be a good adult, um, but they don't realize everybody's freaking out. Nobody really has the answers, right? And if you do in high school, you're probably going to be dead by the time you're 20. But, <laughs> you know, so it's just such a time of being surrounded by people, but also feeling incredible isolation. And there's a, a part in the book where Melody talks about Emily as an adult. And, and I thought, God, you know, she nailed it. Cause if I talked about my high school self now, I probably would say the same things. Like I was such a geek. I had no idea. Um, you know, just a total nerd. Um, and I thought I was so cool and people thought I was probably thought I was cool. Maybe anyone watching this who went to school with me would be laughing right now, but yeah. it, it, so it, that kind of thing I really like, I love to play with perception. And I mean, that's what you do as a crime writer, right? right you rely right. on perception. You and I have read a ton of books. We know what's expected. So we know how to write the unexpected. Yeah, exactly. But, and I also love Laura. You know, she it really changed. I mean, really didn't like her, you know, at the beginning, at the, at the graduation. I won't say any more, any spoilers, but I was like, wow, she really changed. You know, I really got her. And so I really want to say kudos to that, you know, her, her journey, you know, whatever her journey was. Um, and again, she's, she's like all the characters, they all, you know, they don't have the agenda you think they have, or it's, re it's not revealed, it's underneath. Um, especially Mike. Uh, yeah, what's with Mike? Can you give us a little clue about that? I mean, yeah, you know, I really <laughs> like, I like the character of Mike. Um, and I think, you know, I think he says a lot about Andrea, just their relationship, because her response to everything that happened to pieces of her is, I need to change everything. Yeah. And there's this great line that her mother says, Laura says to Andrea in the beginning of the book, wherever you go, there you are. Right. Like, and, and so we all had a friend in college, or maybe we were that person who dated just the shittiest guys. And she's like, why are these guys so shitty? And we're like, why are you picking such shitty guys? Right. We never think maybe I'm the problem. Um, and so, I mean, that's kind of what Andrea is doing. She's like, I got to push everybody away. I got to change things. Uh, and, and then I'll be magically a different person. And her mother knows that doesn't happen because she's lived a life, right? More than Andrea. And Andrea just kind of figures that out slowly, but surely. And, and I think a lot of that insight comes from, um, just seeing how Emily lived her life. And, you know, understanding, you know, here I am in another small town, 
on the coast, very much like the small town on the coast I grew up in, and I'm still the same person. So maybe everybody else isn't the problem. Maybe I'm the problem. Right. That's right. Wow. Do you think you'll be writing another uh, one with Andrea? I mean, is there, I sort of felt there was definitely room for another story. There was more in her saga. Do you see, you know, is this maybe going to be a trilogy or? You, you know, know do I don't think... know. My next book is a, a Will and Sarah. I've already started Yay! writing. Yeah, yeah. Yay! Um, but, uh, I, you know, never say never. Um, mm -hmm. And there are some books I'd like to go to back to first, like Cop Town. I really enjoyed that world. Um, but I mean, we'll see. We'll see what happens. That's great. I'm I'm glad that there's there's not a never there. Um, is there any book that you're reading now or that you that's on your to be read pile? If you even get a chance to, because you're starting your tour and I know you're you're working on the book. Is there any book that maybe is not people don't talk about? You know, you feel has fallen under the radar that you think should get another shout out? Is there anything you want to share? One. And if you're this one right here, this is amazing. Yay! I love that book. Jennifer Hillier. She wrote Jar of Hearts a while back. Um, and I I got this and I was like, holy crap, this is so good. I love her. Um, so uh it's uh on sale date 7 19 22. So it's out, right? Yeah, I read it. I love yeah. it. Yep. It's a she's an amazing writer. So I would pick up that. Um I did a, an event with uh, Mary Kay Andrews, and one of the things I do in events is I, if I don't like the title of the book, I change it. So this still has the change. Um, <laughs> what is it? I get, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, this is also good, but I believe it's called Home Wreckers, um, oh, okay. and I I changed it because I like my title better. Uh, but those are two good ones. They're very different, but they're one's a, one is a lot of fun, and one of them is um, a, a, like a more straight thriller. Sure. I just want to put in a word for Night Work by Dan Festerman. I don't have it with me. He was a writer at the Baltimore Sun, I think, like with Laura Lippman and all that, and you know was stationed in Europe when the wall fell. And this book, he sort of revisits that time. Night Work, I think it's called, and it's. It's just this whole other side with wall comes down. What do you do? You know, with living with the Stasi, with people, you know, who were, you know, all these files on you. It's kind of like, like you like, you know, with the crimes of the past. What do you do if you, you're confronted? Your neighbor was the Nazi Stasi person who informed on you, you know? So that, that's just a book I, I just really liked a lot. Um, is there anything you want to tell us or share with us about your upcoming tour or anything we should be knowing? people want to come out and see you will um, you be doing it in person yes yeah i'm in person and i it starts tomorrow and i'll be at poison pen in arizona and i'm very excited because part of it is uh to raise money for kitten rescue there there's a great little organization uh but they bring little kittens and let me hold them and okay. that's why i support them I'm there for that's the cool. i'm not uh, I, I believe you. Talk, can you tell people more about your um, the life, the Save the Libraries project? I know that's very important to you and you've done so much work about it, but for some of us who don't know about it, what can we do here on the West Coast? Well, I mean, I, I think we got other questions from people too. So this will be, sure. a, yeah, so I'll, I'll wind this up. So Save the Libraries is a private organization and we've given away about half a million bucks so far. And what we do is we say, fix the toilet, paint the walls, have a reading circle, whatever you need to do to keep the doors open. And it's so important that kids have access to reading because they're so selfish uh, when, when they come out. All they care about is themselves. And if you give them books, then they say, oh, Harold has a purple crayon. I have a purple <laughs> crayon. So maybe people are different from me, right? Or maybe people have other cultures and they understand other languages and live in other worlds. And it stops them from being so selfish. Uh, and that I think is a good thing. And I think it's very important that we have every book that the library can carry at the library. And if you don't want your children to read those books, then don't let them read them, but don't parent other people's children. 
Well said, well said. Thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, so, Allison, are there some questions? So a couple questions. Um, one is, well, okay, I wanna know now, um, since you held that book up where you changed the title, are there any of your books that you would change the title in a, in a humorous way that way? <laughs> Well, so I did an event with uh, Mary Kay Andrews and her posse of uh, writers at Friends in Fiction, and they changed the name to Grill Forgotten, um, <laughs> and they put on chef's hats, and uh, and I so I got to talk about Weber Grills, and, you know, <laughs> it was a searing conversation. Um, oh, stop. <laughs> they, uh, they really grilled me on the details, so I think that was good. <laughs> that's great um and do you have any favorite characters I mean I know authors always say they're all their children the books are all their children of course you can't have you know a favorite book necessarily or the favorite book is the one you just wrote but um are there any characters you identify with or feel like um you know particularly an affinity for so I've been writing about Sarah Linton for over 20 years. Mm -hmm. And so she's she's the one I feel closest to. And I when I started writing her, I wanted her to change. You know, that was the one thing that I didn't like about a lot of books I was reading at the time is, you know, you get this long series of books and the character from the first page of that first book was the same as what you read 20 books later. And horrible, horrible stuff was happening and they never changed, right? Mm -hmm. So I wanted I wanted her to change and to grow up and to, you know, be a different person because of what she was seeing. So when we meet her in Blindsided, she's pretty black and white about things. Mm -hmm. And then as the series progressive, she realizes there are a lot of grays. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I think in some ways she's a reflection of, of me getting older, um, though I would not have her be as old as me. She had <laughs> too many bad things happen to her already. Um, but, you know, in your 20s, you're sort of like, Duh! you know, you don't know what to do and you make yeah. stupid mistakes. And then in your 30s, you're like, oh, my God, I'm an adult. I can't <laughs> believe I made those stupid mistakes. And then your 40s, you're like, eh, fuck it, you know. <laughs> Yeah. If I want to eat cake, I'm going to eat cake. If I want to go to bed at nine, so what? You know, so Sarah has gone through those transitions with me as well. That's awesome. That's great. Um, and um, we actually have a question from Dexter who says, what's your favorite cupcake flavor? Are you a cupcake fanatic? Okay. Oh, yes. Yes. Okay. Um, and also, I have a cat named Dexter. Oh, um, Perfect. Yes. Was it based on the Was it based on the Dexter series, which is amazing? Yes, because um, he was a stray, and I kept finding like I just called my front yard the killing fields. <laughs> <laughs> he just left all kinds of dead animals there. Yeah. <laughs> so, and he brought one in the house the other day. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I I'm I hate to. It just depends on my mood because I'm not like totally into chocolate. I, I like a vanilla with white frosting a lot or like a lemon. Uh -huh. and there's this great small chain of, cup, of cupcakes place, place called um, uh, Georgetown Cupcakes. And they actually do like a cheesecake lemon cupcake. Oh. Yeah, it's fantastic. Oh my God. Okay, good to know, good to know. Um, and, uh, let's see, one of the other things, when you were at the bookstore at Book Passage some years ago, um, you actually said, let's not talk about the book. Let's just talk about other stuff. And I just thought that was the most fun thing, you know, because we're going to read the book. And so you don't want to have any, um, you know, spoilers, but I just wondered if that's common, if you do that a lot. Yeah, you know, part of it is I do feel like people should read the book, but as Kara will tell you, it's really hard to talk about a lot of my books without giving massive spoilers. Right. Um, right. And, and so that's one of the reasons. And also, um, you know, sometimes when I, I talk about the book and I've got to go home and start a new book, it's hard for me to get my brain out of the old book and into the new book. So that's like very self-serving on my part. Um <laughs> So yeah, that that and I don't read. Do, Cara, do you read your book from your books when you do events? I don't. I don't do that because I feel no. like it makes people go to sleep. Right, and they came like you know, like we're all here to 
you know, to, if we don't know you to meet you or to, you know, come back after five years and hear your funny stories or, you know, it's about really getting to know the author, you know, do you, do I like that person? Is she funny? Is, you know, will I like the book? So it's about getting to know you as an author, you know, why would you do that? What kind of person are you? You know, yeah. people always say, you know, to me, you, you look like such the nicest person, you know, you're, you're killing people <laughs> everywhere. And I'm like, yes. <laughs> Right. And, and yeah, what's your point? <laughs> yeah, what's your point? <laughs> yeah. Well, Kari, you said something interesting when I mentioned before about um, mystery writers having humor. Um, <laughs> will yeah. you tell say what you said about that? That your response? Yes, you were talking about certain kinds of writers, and I will say, was it romance writers or travel writers? You know about how some people got a little frustrated or cranky after being in this workshop for four days. And you said, but but you mystery writers, you're always so happy. You're having a great sense of humor. You're having fun. You never you never seem to be like that. And I said, well, you know why, don't, don't you? And you said, no, because we get our aggressions out on the page. We can kill people on the page, right, Karen? <laughs> I mean, and we're good, we're good. Yeah, we do it, we're good. It's, we don't have these hidden, you know, yearning longings. You know, I think romance writers, um, you know, have a lot of bad rep personally, you know, at conferences. <laughs> yeah, they'll cut a bit. They will. Yeah. So Karen, do you yeah. feel like you get out your aggressions out on the page? Like it it's sort of cathartic? Um, well, yes or no, because I tend to get my aggressions out uh, whenever I feel aggressive. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I, but I'm kind of, I'm mostly a laid back person. It takes a lot to really get to me. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, it's like no one ever, ever, ever recognizes me unless I'm in a really horrible situation, like at the airport where they lost my luggage and I'm about to lose my shit. And they're like, oh, are you Karen Slaughter? Like, okay, great. I'm not the anonymous person complaining about my luggage being lost now. Not anymore. Yeah. So you kind of lose your ability to complain audibly. Right. But, um, you know, I do, I do think a lot of the darkness we were able to get out. Um, but also mm -hmm. as women, I think women deal with like a low level of anxiety mm -hmm. with almost every every interaction that takes place out of the home, right? Yeah, there's, good there's point. always like this fear and, and not that we live in fear, but you know, we're just aware of things in a way that men don't have to be. Yeah, we have to be girl, like alert. Yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, parking lot or just you know right. when you go out at night it's just right. part of how you yeah. have to think yeah. and I remember several years ago I was at this weird you know how sometimes you're at weird dinners with people at, from Hollywood and they want to write books and there was this guy who was like a travel writer for Good Morning America and and it was at the height of the uh, Iraq war and he's like well I would have no problem going to Iraq because there's a you know there's a government there there the, so you know I would feel completely secure going there and I looked at him I was like god what it must feel like to never think about being gang raped right he was exactly. shocked he was yeah. shocked I mean yeah. just, women just look at things a little differently so I think that part is something that you can certainly exercise on the page because yeah. if, if we just sat around and talked about that kind of stuff all the time it would be very very depressing but it is something that we just kind of silently live with and even the guys who love us have no idea they just don't know what it's like that's so true i i just recently had a discussion with my husband because we have two daughters about how as a man you just do not understand that experience of having to think twice about going out at night or whatever it is and i think that's part of why we love reading um strong female characters in your books and karen your books you know we want to see women um excelling at um you know being strong um not necessarily even physical but just having this ability to um you know just be forthright and go out there and 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 chase killers or whatever it is we can fantasize about it well and also like the wonderful thing about crime fiction is that you know the bad person is going to get caught and punished yep. That's right, right. <laughs> I mean, probably there are people in florida who are going to spend more time in prison for registering to vote when they weren't allowed to than like rapists yeah 
Exactly, exactly. Well, I have a couple more questions. Um, so uh, Rowan says, as a writer, I'd love to ask Karen, any tips for successfully pulling off a plot twist? <laughs> Yeah, just uh, it, I touched on this before. Just you, if you really read crime fiction, you know what's the expected thing, and don't do it. Find <laughs> something else. I mean, it's really hard because there are a lot of really nice tropes out there, or lean into it and have it be something completely different. I mean, that that to me is the the mark of a, a talent is to not go with what's easy, but work out the hard parts. Yeah, good answer. Um, so Laura says, I'll see you in Ohio in a couple of days. Any plans of heading closer to Michigan? Um, I, you know, I love Michigan. Uh, Pot Potoski, Potoski. I like <laughs> being there. Detroit is amazing. Um, I'm going to be in Ohio at the Cuyahoga Library, which is a wonderful system, but I'm sure I'll make it to Michigan again. You know, I've seen a lot of Michigan. I haven't been much into the UP. I'd love to see that. Um, so maybe next year. Okay, great. Um, Cara, do you have any other questions or? Well, it just made me think when you when you said that, do something, lean into the trope and do what's not expected. One time I heard this British author say, yeah, it's like we put our characters up in a tree and the tree, you know, and then we throw rocks at them. Then they have to climb higher and as they climb higher that you know the branches are thinner and thinner and you know it's also about the suspense you know which i didn't you know ask you about Karen, but i mean you know every chapter at the end you know you just have to turn the, the next chapter and of course then we've got the dual timeline so we've got to you know keep hurry reading that to find out what happens with the next like emily but but that's really a skill i mean to you know to have people turn the pages and to be so invested in the characters which you just do beautifully so that's a gush. I mean, that wasn't really a question. But, um, yeah, I, I mean, so I think, I, I don't know. I think if you, how could you say to someone, you've got to think about pacing. I mean, you, you talk about that, but, you know, it's, it's you, you know, it's got to have cliffhangers and, and that's hard. That's a really hard act to um, pull off, I would, I think. Well, I mean, it's the, that's the type, I guess that's what makes it a thriller is the pacing, right? As opposed to a mystery mm -hmm. is more deliberative. And, you know, I grew up watching TBS after school uh, and there was always a cliffhanger at the commercial to bring you back. And so yeah. that, that's drilled into me. And, you know, every girl I know rushed home from school to watch Luke and Laura on General Hospital. And so that that's where my training came from. And, uh, you know, that you always have to have a cliffhanger that brings you back from the commercial. Yeah, that's right. Like soap operas. Yeah. Or in England, what is it? Coronation Street, that long running, yeah. huge, yeah. huge thing. Even the queen watches it. It's like, you know, they just. Yeah, it's like you know, 50 years old. <laughs> oh, we have one more question from the audience. Um, do you have opinions on the cast of your characters? You know, um, I think Tony Collette did an amazing job. Um, Ramon Rodriguez is playing Will Trent, and Ooh. he's um, he's from Puerto Rico, which you know, Will Will could have just as easily been from Puerto Rico. The way I describe him in the novel is not Ramon, though he's a, a very sexy guy and he does <laughs> an amazing job, particularly with Betty the Chihuahua. They have amazing chemistry. Um, <laughs> But, you know, the book is the book and the show is the show. And I, I hope people um, enjoy it and give it a chance because the stories are so great. And I think they'll end up loving that Will Trent as much as they love the Will Trent in my books. But, you know, I just, I keep coming back to it. The show is the show and the book is the book. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Here, here's the book that um, Cara's you holding up. Uh, I can't wait to get it tomorrow. As soon as it comes in, I'm grabbing a copy. We will have signed copies at our bookstore. And um, I want to thank you both so much, Karen. Thank you so much for being here. My only disappointment is that we didn't get to have you in person, but maybe next time. Um, we love your books. We love having you and um, have a wonderful tour and a great launch. So um, thank you guys so much. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you, you. You're very welcome, Karen. Good luck on the road. Bye. Bye.
with the kitties. 